So um, as I said, I'm the co-founder and uh, currently the CEO. It's my fourth role in the company, so quite a big journey. I'll talk today a little bit uh, about where Barrio is now, so the company presentation products, and of course our latest product, Aero, a bit of highlighting on that one, as well as then talk a little bit of what we're doing next, especially in the realm of Barrio's reality cloud. Uh, again, something that Jussi Havu also uh, alluded in his previous presentation, the ability to render in the cloud as opposed to on the headset, enabling you to have almost infinite compute and, and a lot of other benefits as well. And then uh, a little bit on the future of virtual teleportation as well. So that should be interesting. But good, let's uh, kick it off now with the things now happening at Vario. So Vario is now roughly 170 people. I don't actually know the number anymore accurately. Uh, we are hiring actively, so do check out our job positions. Um, we would be more than welcome engineers and, and uh, other for example, business people, uh, both from Nordics and across the globe. Uh, I, I think we have almost uh, people from almost 20 nationalities these days working in uh, Vario, so we are very multinational. So even if you wouldn't be a Finnish resident, you would be more than feeling uh, at home in there. We have uh, over 23 uh, B2B value-added partners selling our B2B headsets globally. And we have now, of course, also opened uh, some B2C channels also with retail partners. We have well over 1,000 customer companies, um, and this ranges from a few headsets to a few hundred headsets per company. So the scale is, is quite nicely happening, and especially the Aero has actually um, already now uh, uh, scaled quite a lot of, of new smaller customers into the into the customer base. Here's a bit of a show of the type of companies we have. So typically Fortune 500 alike companies in the training and simulations domain, medical and research and design and engineering. And I don't think much of this one is news, but it's a good repetition in any case. So let's uh, focus a little bit on the Aero, which is made both for leading edge VR users without prior Vario experience, as well as for current Vario users, mainly in B2B domain, obviously, who are ready for mass adoption of VR. So this is a product that we're using also to scale in many of our existing customer based companies, as uh, it comes with two benefits for scaling. One, lower cost. Secondly, uh, lower PC requirement. So making it much easier for you to actually get those PCs that you use to run these beautiful, beautiful headsets. Uh, I don't want to take this into a, into a sales pitch for the Vario, just setting a bit of context to you. Uh, one of the definite benefits of the Vario Aero is that um, it became now the second headset on the market to be approved by a uh, European Aviation Safety Agency for, uh, be, for real pilot training. So you basically get credits from flying with it, similarly to as uh, flying on a bigger dome simulator or flying the actual plane. It's, it's, this is the very first um, venture into VR training in the aviation, civilian aviation side. And again, like I was surprised by this, uh, that it happened now. I was expecting a couple of more years. Um, it, it happened for the VR3 in the summer and almost instantly now in the autumn for the Aero because of the similarities. So both VR3 and the Aero are approved for um, VRM's uh, simulation system by European Aviation Safety Agency. So it gives you a, like a glimpse of the kind of quality level that also, for example, as a flight enthusiast, you have now access to same grade of technology as the professionals have been doing in the past. So you get very similar experience as you do in a full dome simulator. simulator. So then uh, on the uh, ta uh, target specs for the hardware, so you can see that compared to the VR3 and the XR3, 
Aero is actually functioning on a mid-range GPUs. And I was just really pleasantly surprised to see that uh, VR Flight Sim guy, for example, was doing a test of HP Reverb G2 performance. So how much it actually taxes the GPU, how good frame rate you get with that one in Microsoft Flight Simulator, as opposed to running the same thing on Aero. And he was raving about that you actually get uh, something like 20 to 30 percent higher frame rates on the aero while getting that much higher quality simultaneously uh, again a pretty magnificent thing and this is really uh, like a good testimony into the scaling capabilities of the aero so so mid-range uh, gpu cpu configuration is fine with the aero so you can run it on a laptop you can run it on a mid-range desktop PC or a backpack PC, for example, from HP. And uh, again, the similarly, BR3 and XR3 are demanding more, so you should be expecting to basically shelve out a high-end GPU of either 20 uh, series or 30 series uh, to use on that one. On the range overall, um, just reminding, VR3 is the world's like utmost highest quality VR headset on the market with human eye resolution displays, eye and hand tracking available for $33.95 plus $7.95 annually. XR3 comes with obviously the same eye and hand tracking, but then also with the mixed reality, including LiDAR and the same human eye resolution displays available. Uh, at $59.95 to all companies, and then for $14.95 annually. And then the Aero, which is available to all uh, for $19.95, uh, comes with the eye tracking, superbly lightweight, ultra bright mini LED displays that are twice the brightness of the uh, VR3 and the XR3, and I dare to say pretty much any other headset on the market as well. It's one of the things that you actually should experience. So we should have an Aero headset at the event. So please go and check it out. Uh, just seeing that brightness and that beautiful image quality is something that I don't want to show on a slide now. You should experience it uh, first and there. And Kimi can certainly also help on that one also later on. Um, then I have on this image one uh, small adder uh, on the on the list of, of new things, which is our latest laptop adapter, making it super easy to uh, connect uh, a Vario Aero headset directly to a laptop, where um, where uh, the only thing that you need additionally is then uh, the power supply unit that uh, gives some additional power to the Aero. Much simpler integration, especially when you're going to a customer, like a click, click, done. Good. Then continuing on the now, Vario Teleport VR software and service suite is available uh, since roughly a week ago. And it comes for free to anybody owning XR3 or VR3. And uh, that includes uh, support for three concurrent users, and then you can purchase bigger uh, sales volumes as well. It supports also uh, any other Steam VR compatible headset, including also the uh, Oculus headsets uh, that are connected to to PC. Good, uh, either uh, with a cable or without a cable, obviously. So uh, what the Vario Teleport does? Teleport VR does is that it enables you to meet, share, and collaborate virtually uh, with a larger group. Uh, very similar type of thing that what we, for example, saw on the glue side, except that the focus of this software is really mainly on certain uh, use cases. Uh, at, and at the moment, it's the best in the BIM sector. So in uh, construction uh, domain and in there doing design reviews and actionating on those. And we are now expanding the compatibility from beyond that sector into other ranges of design, improving the experience um, and, and the user flow uh, tremendously. So I would say that this is the perfect solution at the moment if you're doing any kind of bigger um, bigger activities in both uh, designing and working with a customer in the architecture engineering and construction side but um, 
then uh, if you're on the other ventures of design, you would definitely want to check it out, see how it works right now into our workflow, and let us know how we should be improving on that one. And we have plenty of more material if you're interested at our website. And with this, I'm moving to next things happening at Vario. So as a context, I obviously cannot talk uh, much about what kind of hardware we are actually developing in the future. So I'm giving a, a bit of framing uh, in the beginning instead. And uh, one of these that I also spoke at the, at the previous um, uh, event at the XR Center is that the six dot headset volume is surpassing 100 million during 2025. So we are at the breaking point that uh, VR and mixed reality is actually becoming a mainstream thing. That kind of volume does mean real mainstream use. Simultaneously and partially driving that is the change in the form factor of the headsets towards eyeglass form factors that you see, for example, here as the backdrop. It's the HTC's Flow headset that truly, I think, looks spectacular and feels really good on the head. Um, and it's showing the road to the future. Again, I cannot show what we are doing, but I can certainly show that this is what HTC is doing and many other companies as well. Um, and it's uh, predominantly driven by new type of optics called uh, pancake lenses, which are folded optics that makes it possible to squeeze the size of the headset tremendously. So, um, and, and I do think that this kind of things are necessary to drive the wider adoption as well. And again, like really pleasantly happy to see HTC doing their forerunner position uh, in this domain uh, once again. You could argue that uh, that Facebook is doing something similar in this domain, and I, I expect many companies to be releasing products that have similarity to what um, Facebook, uh, what uh, HTC is showing here. And, and obviously, as far as we are following the trends in the market as well. Then finally, uh, I'd maybe raise the point that operating system and chipset game is starting because of the exact same thing. Um, so so uh, adoption curve towards mass market forces you to think what's going to be your like a uh, longer term position when it comes to operating systems and chipsets. And I dare say that uh, that uh, Facebook will have a very moderate likelihood that they would be doing play on this one before they roll out into their next magnitude of, of uh, device uh, uh, volume. You don't want to do that too late as then you're um, uh, then you're being nasty to your partners as well as to your customers. So so I would assume that will be happening within the next two years. Um, then for your reality cloud that we see as instrumental in especially the B2B setting on, on devices like those. So lightweight devices that you can wear comfortably, that you can give to your customer easily, that nobody should be afraid to wear on their heads, does mean that you start to have limitations on the amount of compute you can have there. So for that one, we have been since last summer uh, talking about various reality cloud, and I'll shed a bit uh, of light into that one again today. First of all, you basically get instantly access to infinite compute on the cloud, both for the GPU, CPU, and RAM scaling. You can essentially decide that I want to now run in 100 CPU cores with, uh, with four high-end GPUs driving the graphics, and with a terabyte of RAM available to me. And the cloud will just configure itself for you. You will pay more, but you will be able to have the real-time ray tracings and things like that on as you need and pay only what you need, when you need it. Then you can be running on much lower grade cloud hardware when you're actually setting up the things and exploring. And I, I dare say, that with uh, with uh, solutions like this, 
you will ultimately pay much less than you would if you would be purchasing uh, a PC of equivalent capability. Typically, people also don't use uh, the VR headsets eight hours a day. Uh, so so it's, it, it gives you the opportunity to save most of the uh, part of the day's uh, CPU, GPU compute. Good. Then, of course, um, turnkey is super important part in here, especially in the B2B setting. So um, by enabling so that you configure your experiences once in the cloud and say then that, OK, anybody connecting here will get this exact same experience and you can guarantee it. It does enable you to have a click to scale both from from the perspective of within your organization, but um, but also externally, you can offer reliable services that once configured once are really turnkey and and they will just work. This is one of the things that we have been getting from our alpha partners that they feel, uh, for example, in the automotive design domain that this allows them to much more easily take the decision makers into the loop because all they need to do is that they send a link to their email. So just put the headset on, click on the link and you will be able to see the latest thing. Uh, look at it and tell me your opinion on the one, two, three type of thing. Again, no hassle and also no need to move to a VR lab, uh, perhaps in a totally different building or anything like that. It scales uh, both for the headset sales and then uh, for, for the use cases for these companies. Um, then hardware independence is, of course, a natural evolution of, of the cloud rendering. So once you render in the cloud, in a sense, it's just a video stream going to the headset. Obviously, it's not, but uh, like uh, it, it, it makes it really easy to deploy to pretty much any PC VR or Android VR headset super easily access through laptops, tablets, phones or anything like that. And here, of course, one of the key things is to guarantee the ultra low data rates so that you don't need gigabit connections uh, to the devices and ruin the, the network conditions at your company. Um, and then, uh, of course, latency is required so that you can enable normal VLAN use there. So um, as said, I cannot prematurely show you things. So here, instead of showing the current uh, customer cases of the uh, of the uh, Barrier Reality Cloud with our Alpha customers, here is a demonstration from I think uh, beginning of this year, together with Autodesk, on a very similar type of setup system in a garage. Again, showing the the different. Uh, uh, types of devices in use, heterogeneous comp uh, compute for the clients, and then cloud compute for the actual visuals. Joining both mixed reality side uh, here locally, so the camera feed is staying on the tablets or on the XR3 connected PC, and then only the virtual things are calculated on the cloud. Um, good, but the alphas are ongoing. The response is incredibly positive and 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 we are really solving exactly the key problems that we have been uh, uh, striking out to solve with the Barrier Reality Cloud. So we're super happy on that one. Moving to a more wider range of companies now gradually once we are more confident that things are nicely in place. Uh, you could call it beta. I don't think that we will actually call it beta. It's just a continuation of the alphas, but um, it's a progression. And we're simultaneously securing, obviously, the global server infrastructure and preparing for this to actually become a product. When, well, no comments on that one, but you get the gist that uh, that we typically run the alphas um, for a few months and, and then, uh, then then plan for the actual rollout. So no commitments, but, um, but sooner than later uh, as a product to the market. We do also feel that this is the first actually scalable cloud rendering solution product uh, that comes with uh, really all the enablers to turn it into a turnkey solution. Good, then uh, talking a bit on the Vario Teleport. So 
the teleportation beyond the Vario Teleport VR and our grander vision of it. So fully immersive live presence on the other side of the globe, traveling without moving, reducing the business travel needs, enabling both perception of the place and the people and the machines or anything which is happening in there, real time the same way as if you were there yourself, with of course caveat on the time zone. So you cannot uh, shortcut that one. It's simultaneously hindrance and opportunity. So sometimes you might need to actually like uh, work at um, awkward hours to do a teleport session. At least you can do it from home as needed. And uh, then of course teleportation does enable the opportunity to save sessions, save how it felt to actually be there. And you can then replay it to your colleagues at a later point and they get a very similar experience. And again, like experience being the one of the key points here that when you use a true teleportation that for example, we are developing, it feels that you're experiencing that other side and not just looking at it through a small window on your uh, monitor screen. Uh, we also see uh, opportunities in selectively teleporting uh, parts of the real world into VR collaboration systems like Glue or uh, the Vario Teleport VR. So you could say that when we are doing our planning, keep this physical machine, which is there in China, keep it all the time visible to us in this collaboration session. And, and maybe we do something with it uh, simultaneously. Then, of course, scanning places also in a static manner is super useful for collaboration purposes. And, and certainly whenever you decide to do something static versus dynamic, you can achieve even higher level of fidelity. And, and this is one of the areas that we're like very interestingly looking at right now. But really, uh, for the teleportation to make sense, you need to have a video call like latency. You cannot uh, pass the boundaries of uh, light speed, but you can uh, stay as close to that one as possible. And when you actually do a teleportation, you can actually pay a bit of premium to the network operators in your path to guarantee that lower latency uh, than even video call can actually be achieved, which is interesting. So uh, the kind of use cases that we're now thinking, why I'm like highlighting these is that I'm ultra interested in any new ideas that either fit into these domains or fit outside of them. So opening the minds. So first of all, obviously meeting in the hybrid world is different than it used to be, both during COVID when everything was only done through Teams and Zooms and the past when the meetings were done mainly face to face. Now, some of the people will be uh, outside of the room and some really still want to get that humane connection. So how to actually uh, make those happen in the hybrid world is one of our like uh, key connection points. Then ability to uh, go survey, for example, uh, your factories, your uh, partners locations, your suppliers locations, your own offices in the other uh, part of the world keep connected to your uh, colleagues uh, in there and, and so forth. It's it's a really wide domain overall. And, and again, like a significant amount of world business travel is focused to actually doing exactly this. So if you can do it virtually or, or through means of teleportation, it's a game changer. Uh, also, a lot of ecological points of view onto that. Remote assistance review, uh, partially related to the to these, but like uh, uh, focused on on actually solving real world issues as fast as possible, and then training and learning, which again you can do differently when you can um, uh, get people to be uh, on the, for example, in this case, the Airbus uh, assembly facility, where you couldn't take a classroom of people to be sitting. Uh, or standing behind these people uh, at the at the uh, factory line for for hours and hours on end, but you could do it live, uh, keep it interactive, get people to also ask questions, 
or do it pre-recorded again, which is uh, 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 an, an extension that I feel uh, to be part of the Teleport VR or Teleport functionalities where you can uh, kind of teleport also beyond time as well, experiencing the things after the fact. And with that, uh, I hope I stayed roughly on time. So I thank you. And, and you can contact me at uh, Twitter, at my uh, contory, um, um, uh, alias. And then uh, if you have more use cases for teleport, uh, do contact me on my email at uh, urho at vario.com. And I'm very open to, to both short and longer discussions on topics and as, as well as, as looking at, at early alpha opportunities, as we are now at the stage that we are able to actually test the things already end to end. So we're not at alpha yet, but uh, gradually planning to, to that as well. So thank you. <laughs>